Part the First, The Lotus, Section Two, of Thais by Anatole France. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part the First, Section Two. In the morning he saw the ibises motionless on one leg at the edge of the water, which reflected their pale pink necks. The willows stretched their grey foliage to the bank. Cranes flew in a triangle in the clear sky, and the cry of unseen herons was heard from the sedges. Far as the eye could reach, the river rolled its broad green waters, or which white sails, like the wings of birds, glided, and here and there, on the shores, a white house shone out. A light mist floated along the banks, and from out of the shadows of the islands, which were laden with palms, flowers, and fruits, came noisy flocks of ducks, geese, flamingos, and teal. To the left, the grassy valley extended to the desert, its fields and orchards in joyful abundance. The sun shone on the yellow wheat, and the earth exhaled forth its fecundity in odorous wafts. At this sight, Paphnutius fell on his knees and cried, Blessed be the Lord, who has given a happy issue to my journey. O God, who spreadest thy dew upon the fig trees of the Arsiniote, pour thy grace upon Thais, whom thou hast formed with thy love, as thou hast the flowers and trees of the field. May she, by thy loving care, flourish like a sweet-scented rose in the heavenly Jerusalem. And every time that he saw a tree covered with blossom, or a bird of brilliant plumage, he thought of Thais. Keeping along the left arm of the river and through a fertile and populous district, he reached in a few days the city of Alexandria, which the Greeks have surnamed the Beautiful and the Golden. The sun had risen an hour when he beheld from the top of the hill the vast city, the roofs of which glittered in the rosy light. He stopped and folded his arms on his breast. There, then, he said, is the delightful spot where I was born in sin, the bright air where I breathed poisonous perfumes, the sea of pleasure where I heard the songs of the sirens. There is my cradle, after the flesh, my native land, in the parlance of the men of these days. A rich cradle, an illustrious country, in the judgment of men. It is natural that thy children should reverence thee like a mother, Alexandria. And I was begotten in thy magnificently adorned breast. But the ascetic despises nature. The mystic scorns appearances. The Christian regards his native land as a place of exile. The monk is not of this earth. I have turned away my heart from loving thee, Alexandria. I hate thee. I hate thee for thy riches, thy science, thy pleasures, and thy beauty. Be a cursed temple of demons, lewd couch of the Gentiles, tainted pulpit of Arian heresy, be thou accursed. And thou, winged son of heaven, who led the holy hermit Anthony, our father, when he came from the depths of the desert and entered into the citadel of idolatry to strengthen the faith of believers and the confidence of martyrs, beautiful angel of the Lord, invisible child, first breath of God, fly thou before me, and cleanse by the beating of thy wings the corrupted air I am about to breathe amongst the princes of darkness of this world. Having thus spoken, he resumed his journey. He entered the city by the gate of the sun. This gate was a handsome structure of stone, in the shadow of its arch crowded some poor wretches who offered lemons and figs for sale, or with many groans and lamentations begged for an obolus. 
An old woman in rags, who was kneeling there, seized the monk's cassock, kissed it, and said, Man of the Lord, bless me, that God may bless me. I have suffered many things in this world, that I may have joys in the world to come. You come from God, O holy man, and that is why the dust of your feet is more precious than gold. The Lord be praised, said Paphnutius, and with his half-closed hand he made the sign of redemption on the old woman's head. But hardly had he gone twenty paces down the street than a band of children began to jeer at him and throw stones, crying, Oh, the wicked monk! He is blacker than an ape and more bearded than a goat. He is a skulker. Why not hang him in an orchard like a wooden priapus to frighten the birds? But no, he would draw down the hail on the apple blossom. He brings bad luck. To the ravens with the monk, to the ravens and stones mingled with the cries. "'My God bless these poor children,' murmured Pomphnutius. And he pursued his way, thinking, "'I was worshipped by the old woman, and hated and despised by these children. Thus the same object is appreciated differently by men who are uncertain in their judgment and liable to error.' It must be owned that, for a Gentile, old Timocles was not devoid of sense. Though blind, he knew he was deprived of light. His reasoning was much better than that of these idolaters, who cry from the depths of their thick darkness, I see the day. Everything in this world is mirage and moving sand. God alone is steadfast. He passed through the city with rapid steps. After ten years of absence, he would still recognize every stone, and every stone was to him a stone of reproach that recalled a sin. For that reason, he struck his naked feet roughly against the curbstones of the wide street, and rejoiced to see the bloody marks of his wounded feet. Leaving on his left the magnificent portico of the Temple of Serapis, he entered a road lined with splendid mansions, which seemed to be drowsy with perfumes. Pines, maples, and larches raised their heads above the red cornices and golden acrotaria. Through the half-open doors could be seen bronze statues in marble vestibules, and fountains playing amidst foliage. No noise troubled the stillness of these quiet retreats. Only the distant strains of a flute could be heard. The monk stopped before a house, rather small, but of noble proportions, and supported by columns as graceful as young girls. It was ornamented with bronze busts of the most celebrated Greek philosophers. He recognized Plato, Socrates, Aristotle, Epicurus, and Zeno, and having knocked with the hammer against the door, he waited wrapped in meditation. It is vanity to glorify and meddle these false sages. Their lies are confounded, their souls are lost in hell, and even the famous Plato himself, who filled the earth with his eloquence, now disputes with the devils. A slave opened the door, and seeing a man with bare feet standing on the mosaic threshold, said to him roughly, Go and beg elsewhere, stupid monk, or I will drive you away with a stick. Brother, replied the abbot of Antinoe, all that I ask is that you conduct me to your master, Nicias. My master does not see dogs like you. My son, said Paphnutius, will you please do what I ask and tell your master that I desire to see him? Get out, vile beggar! cried the porter furiously, and he raised his stick and struck the holy man, who, with his arms crossed upon his breast, received unmovedly the blow which fell full in his face, and then repeated gently, Do as I ask you, my son, I beg. The porter tremblingly murmured, Who is this man? 
who is not afraid of suffering. And he ran and told his master. Nicias had just left the bath. Two pretty slave girls were scraping him with striggles. He was a pleasant-looking man with a kind smile. There was an expression of gentle satire in his face. On seeing the monk, he rose and advanced with open arms. It is you, he cried, Paphnutius, my fellow scholar, my friend, my brother. Oh, I knew you again, though, to say the truth, you look more like a wild animal than a man. Embrace me. Do you remember the time when we studied grammar, rhetoric, and philosophy together? You were even then of a morose and wild character, but I liked you because of your complete sincerity. We used to say that you looked at the universe with the eyes of a wild horse, and it was not surprising you were dull and moody. You needed a pinch of attic salt. But your liberality knew no bounds. You cared nothing for either your money or your life. And you had the strange eccentricity of genius and a strange character which interested me deeply. You are welcome, my dear Pamphnutius. After ten years of absence, you have quitted the desert. You have renounced all Christian superstitions and now returned to your old life. I will mark this day with a white stone. Crobiel and Myrtle, he added, turning to the girls, perfume the feet, hands, and beard of my dear guest. They smiled and had already brought the basin, the files, and the metal mirror. But Paphnutius stopped them with an imperious gesture, and lowered his eyes that he might not look upon them, for they were naked. Nicias brought cushions for him, and offered him various meats and drinks, which Paphnutius scornfully refused. Nicias, he said, I have not renounced what you falsely call the Christian superstition, which is the truth of truths. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was the life, and the life was the light of men. My dear Paphnutius, replied Nicias, who had now put on a perfumed tunic, do you expect to astonish me by reciting a lot of words jumbled together without skill, which are no more than a vain murmur? Have you forgotten that I am a bit of a philosopher myself? And do you think to satisfy me with some rags torn by ignorant men from the purple garment of Emilius, when Emilius, Porphyry, and Plato, in all their glory, did not satisfy me? The systems devised by the sages are but tales imagined to amuse the eternal childishness of men. We divert ourselves with them, as we do with the stories of the ass, of the tub, and the Ephesian matron, or any other Milesian fable. And, taking his guest by the arm, he led him into a room where thousands of papyri were rolled up and laid in baskets. "'This is my library,' he said." It contains a small part of the various systems which the philosophers have constructed to explain the world. The Serapium itself, with all its riches, does not contain them all. Alas, they are but the dreams of sick men. He compelled his guest to sit down in an ivory chair, and sat down himself. Paphnutius scowled gloomily at all the books in the library, and said, they ought all to be burned. Oh, my dear guest, that would be a pity, replied Nicias, for the dreams of sick men are sometimes amusing. Besides, if we should destroy all the dreams and visions of men, the earth would lose its form and colors, and we should all sleep in a dull stupidity. Paphnutius continued in the same strain as before. It is certain that the doctrines of the pagans are but vain lies. But God, who is the truth, revealed himself to men by miracles, and he was made flesh and lived among us. Nicias replied, 
You speak well, my dear Paphnutius, when you say that he was made flesh, a god who thinks, acts, speaks, who wanders through nature like Ulysses of old on the Glaucus Sea, is altogether a man. How do you expect that we should believe in this new Jupiter, when the urchins of Athens, in the time of Pericles, no longer believed in the old one? But let us leave all that. You did not come here, I suppose, to argue about the three hypostases. What can I do for you, my dear fellow-scholar? A good deed, replied the abbot of Antinoe. Lend me a perfumed tunic, like the one you have just put on. Be kind enough to add to the tunic, gilt sandals, and a vial of oil to anoint my beard and hair. It is needful also that you should give me a purse with a thousand drachmae in it. That, Onesius, is what I came to ask of you, for the love of God, and in remembrance of our old friendship. Nicias made Crobile and Myrtle bring his richest tunic. It was embroidered after the Asiatic fashion with flowers and animals. The two girls held it open and skillfully showed its bright colors, waiting till Paphnutius should have taken off the cassock which covered him down to his feet. But the monk, having declared that they should rather tear off his flesh than in this garment, they put on the tunic over it. As the two girls were pretty, they were not afraid of men, although they were slaves. They laughed at the strange appearance of the monk thus clad, Crobile called him her dear satrap, as she presented him with the mirror, and Myrtle pulled his beard. But Paphnutius prayed to the Lord and did not look at them. Having tied on the gilt sandals and fastened the purse to his belt, he said to Nicias, who was looking at him with an amused expression, O Nicias, let not these things be an offense in your eyes. For know that I shall make pious use of this tunic, this purse, and these sandals. My dear friend, replied Nicias, I suspect no evil, for I believe that men are equally incapable of doing evil or doing good. Good and evil exist only in the opinion. The wise man has only custom and usage to guide him in his acts. I conform with all the prejudices which prevail at Alexandria, that is why I pass for an honest man. Go, friend, and enjoy yourself. But Paphnutius thought it was needful to inform his host of his intention. Do you know Thais, he said, who acts in the games at the theatre? Oh, she is beautiful, replied Nicias, and there was a time when she was dear to me. For her sake I sold a mill and two fields of corn, and I composed in her honor three books, full of detestably bad verses. Surely beauty is the most powerful force in the world, and were we so made that we could possess it always, we should care as little as may be for the Demiurgos, the Logos, the Eons, and all the other reveries of the philosophers. But I am surprised, my good Paphnutius, that you should have come from the depths of the Tebaid to talk about Thais. Having said this, he sighed gently, and Paphnutius gazed at him with horror, not conceiving it possible that a man should so calmly avow such a sin. He expected to see the earth open and Nicias swallowed up in flames. But the earth remained solid, and the Alexandrian silent, his forehead resting on his hand, and he smiling sadly at the memories of his past youth. The monk rose and continued in solemn tones, Know then, O Nicias, that with the aid of God, I will snatch this woman Thais from the unclean affections of the world, and give her as a spouse to Jesus Christ. If the Holy Spirit does not forsake me, Thais will leave this city and enter a nunnery. Beware of offending Venus, replied Nicias. She is a powerful goddess. She will be angry with you if you take away her chief minister. God will protect me, said Paphnutius. May he also illumine thy heart, Onesius, 
and draw thee out of the abyss in which thou art plunged. And he stalked out of the room, but Nicias followed him and overtook him on the threshold, and placing his hand on his shoulder, whispered into his ear the same words, Beware of offending Venus, her vengeance is terrible. Paphnutius, disdainful of these trivial words, left without turning his head. He felt only contempt for Nicias, but what he could not bear was the idea that his former friend had received the caresses of Thais. It seemed to him to sin with that woman was more detestable than to sin with any other. To him this appeared the height of iniquity, and he henceforth looked upon Nicias as an object of execration. He had always hated impurity, but never before had this vice appeared so heinous to him. Never before had it so seemed to merit the anger of Jesus Christ and the sorrow of the angels. He felt only a more ardent desire to save Thais from the Gentiles, and that he must hasten to see the actress in order to save her. Nevertheless, before he could enter her house, he must wait till the heat of the day was over, and now the morning had hardly finished. Paphnutius wandered through the most frequented streets. He had resolved to take no food that day, in order to be the less unworthy of the favors he had asked of the Lord. To the great grief of his soul, he dared not enter any of the churches in the city, because he knew they were profaned by the Arians, who had overturned the Lord's table. For, in fact, these heretics, supported by the emperor of the East, had driven the patriarch Athanasius from his episcopate, and sown trouble and confusion among the Christians of Alexandria. He therefore wandered about aimlessly, sometimes with his eyes fixed on the ground in humility, and sometimes raised to heaven in ecstasy. After some time he found himself on the quay. Before him lay the harbor, in which were sheltered innumerable ships and galleys, and beyond them, smiling in blue and silver, lay the perfidious sea. A galley, which bore a Nereid at its prow, had just weighed anchor. The rowers sang as the oars struck the water, and already the white daughter of the waters, covered with humid pearls, showed no more than a flying profile to the monk. Steered by her pilot, she cleared the passage leading from the basin of the Eunostus and gained the high seas, leaving a glittering trail behind her. I also thought Paphnutius once desired to embark, singing on the ocean of the world, but I soon saw my folly and the Nereid did not carry me away. Lost in his thoughts, he sat down upon a coil of rope and went to sleep. During his sleep he had a vision. He seemed to hear the sound of a clanging trumpet, and the sky became blood-red, and he knew that the day of judgment had come. Whilst he was fervently praying to God, he saw an enormous monster coming toward him, bearing on its forehead a cross of light, and he recognized the Sphinx of Silsile. The monster seized him between its teeth, without hurting him, and carried him in its mouth, as a cat carries a kitten. Paphnutius was thus conveyed across many countries, crossing rivers and traversing mountains, and came at last to a desert place, covered with scowling rocks and hot cinders, the ground was rent in many places, and through these openings came a hot air. The monster gently put Paphnutius down on the ground and said, Look! And Paphnutius, leaning over the edge of the abyss, saw a river of fire which flowed in the interior of the earth between two cliffs of black rocks. There, in a vivid light, the demons tormented the souls of the damned. The souls preserved the appearance of the bodies which had held them, and even wore some rags of clothing. These souls seemed peaceful in the midst of their torments. One of them, tall and white, his eyes closed, 
a white fillet across his head, and a scepter in his hand, sang. His voice filled the desert shores with harmony. He sang of gods and heroes. Little green devils pierced his lips and throat with red-hot irons, and the shade of Homer still sang. Nearby, old Anaxagoras, bald and hoary, traced figures in the dust with a compass. A demon poured boiling oil into his ear, yet failed somehow to disturb the sage's meditations. And the monk saw many other persons who, on the dark shore by the side of the burning river, read, or quietly meditated, or conversed with other spirits while walking, like the sages and pupils under the shadows of the sycamore trees of Academe. Old Timocles alone had withdrawn from the others and shook his head like a man who denies. One of the demons of the abyss shook a torch before his eyes, but Timocles would see neither the demon nor the torch. Mute with surprise at this spectacle, Paphnutius turned to the monster. It had disappeared, and in place of the sphinx, the monk saw a veiled woman who said, Look and understand, such is the obstinacy of these infidels, that even in hell they remain victims of the illusions which deluded them when on earth. Death has not undeceived them, for it is very plain that it does not suffice merely to die in order to see God. Those who are ignorant of the truth whilst living will be ignorant of it always. The demons which are busy torturing these souls, what are they but agents of divine justice? That is why these souls neither see them nor feel them. They were ignorant of the truth, and therefore unaware of their own condemnation, and God himself cannot compel them to suffer. God can do all things, said the abbot of Antinoi. He cannot do that which is absurd replied the veiled woman. To punish them, they must first be enlightened, and if they possessed the truth, they would be like unto the elect. Vexed and horrified, Paphnutius again bent over the edge of the abyss. He saw the shade of Nicias smiling, with a wreath of flowers on his head, sitting under a burnt myrtle tree. By his side was Aspasia of Miletus, gracefully draped in a woolen cloak, and they seemed to talk together of love and philosophy. The expression of her face was sweet and noble. The rain of fire which fell on them was as refreshing dew, and their feet pressed the burning soil as though it had been tender grass. At this sight Paphnutius was filled with fury. Strike him, O God, strike him, he cried. It is Nicias. Let him weep. Let him groan. Let him grind his teeth. He sinned with Thais. And Paphnutius woke in the arms of a sailor as strong as Hercules, who cried, Quietly, quietly, my friend, by Proteus, the old shepherd of the seals, you slumber uneasily. If I had not caught hold of you, you would have tumbled into Eunostus. It is as true as that my mother sold salt fish that I saved your life. I thank God, replied Paphnutius. And, rising to his feet, he walked straight before him meditating on the vision which had come to him whilst he slept. This vision, he said to himself, is plainly an evil one. It is an insult to divine goodness to imagine hell is unreal. The dream certainly came from the devil. He reasoned thus because he knew how to distinguish between the dreams sent by God and those produced by evil angels. Such discernment is useful to the hermit who lives surrounded by apparitions, and who, in avoiding them, is sure to meet with spirits. The deserts are full of phantoms. When the pilgrims draw near the ruined castle to which the holy hermit Anthony had retired, they heard a noise like that which goes up from the public square of a large city at a great festival. The noise was made by the devils who were tempting the holy man. Paphnutius remembered this memorable example, 
he also called to mind St. John the Egyptian, who for sixty years was tempted by the devil. But John saw through all the tricks of the demon. One day, however, the devil, having assumed the appearance of a man, entered the grotto of the venerable John, and said to him, John, you must continue to fast until tomorrow evening. And John, believing it was an angel who spoke, obeyed the voice of the demon, and fasted the next day until the vesper hour. That was the only victory that the Prince of Darkness ever gained over St. John the Egyptian. And that was but a trifling one. It was therefore not astonishing that Paphnutius knew at once that the vision which had visited him in his sleep was an evil one. Whilst he was gently remonstrating with God for having given him into the power of the demons, he felt himself pushed and dragged amidst a crowd of people who were all hurrying in the same direction. As he was unaccustomed to walk in the streets of a city, he was shoved and knocked from one passer to another like an inert mass, and being embarrassed by the folds of his tunic, he was more than once on the point of falling. Desirous of knowing where all these people could be going, he asked one of them the cause of this hurry. "'Do you not know, stranger,' replied he, "'that the games are about to begin, and that Thais will appear on stage? All the citizens are going to the theatre, and I also am going. Would you like to accompany me?' It occurred to him at once that it would further his design to see Thais in the games, and Paphnutius followed the stranger. In front of them stood the theatre its portico ornamented with shining masks, and its huge circular wall covered with innumerable statues. Following the crowd, they entered a narrow passage, at the end of which lay the amphitheater, glittering with light. They took their places on one of the seats, which descended in steps to the stage, which was empty, but magnificently decorated. There was no curtain to hide the view, and on stage was a mound, such as used to be erected in old times to the shades of heroes. This mound stood in the midst of a camp. Lances were stacked in front of the tents, and golden shields hung from masts, amid boughs of laurel and wreaths of oak. On the stage all was silence, but a murmur, like the humming of bees in a hive, rose from the vast hemicycle filled with spectators. All their faces, reddened by the reflection from the purple awning which waved above them, turned with attentive curiosity towards the large silent stage, with its tomb and tents. The women laughed and ate lemons, and the regular theatre-goers called gaily to one another from their seats. Paphnutius prayed inwardly and refrained from uttering any vain words, but his neighbour began to complain of the decline of the drama. Formerly, he said, clever actors used to declaim under a mask the verses of Euripides and Menander. Now they no longer recite dramas. They act in dumb show, and of the divine spectacles with which Bacchus was honored in Athens, we have kept nothing but what a barbarian, a Scythian even, could understand, attitude and gesture. The tragic mask? the mouth of which was provided with metal tongues that increased the sound of the voice, the coterness, which raised the actors to the height of gods, the tragic majesty and the splendid verses that used to be sung, all have gone. Pantomimus and dancing girls with bare faces have replaced Paulus and Roseus. What would the Athenians of the days of Pericles have said if they had seen a woman on the stage? It is indecent for a woman to appear in public. We must be very degenerate to permit it. It is as certain as that my name is Dorian, that woman is the natural enemy of man and a disgrace to humankind. You speak wisely, replied Paphnutius. Woman is our worst enemy. She gives us pleasure and is to be feared on that account. By the immovable gods, cried Dorian, it is not pleasure that woman gives to man, but sadness, trouble, and black cares. Love is the cause of our most abiding evils. Listen, stranger, when I was a young man I visited Trozine in Argolis, and I saw there a myrtle of a most prodigious size, the leaves of which were covered with innumerable pinholes. And this is what the Trozinians said about that myrtle. Queen Phaedra 
when she was in love with Hippolytus, used to recline idly all day long under the same tree. To beguile the tedium of her weary life, she used to draw out the golden pin which held her fair locks, and pierce with it the leaves of the sweet-scented bush. All the leaves were riddled with holes. After she had ruined the poor young man whom she pursued with her incestuous love, Phaedra, as you know, perished miserably. She locked herself up in her bridal chamber, and hanged herself by her golden girdle from an ivory peg. The gods willed that the myrtle, the witness of her bitter misery, should continue to bear in its fresh leaves the marks of these pinholes. I picked one of these leaves, and placed it at the head of my bed, that by the sight of it I might take warning against the folly of love, and conform to the doctrine of the divine Epicurus, my master, who taught that all lust is to be feared. But, properly speaking, love is a disease of the liver, and one is never sure of catching the malady. Pefnutius asked, Dorian, what are your pleasures? And Dorian replied sadly, I have only one pleasure, and it must be confessed that it is not a very exciting one. It is meditation. When a man has a bad digestion, he must not look for any others. Taking advantage of these words, Paphnutius proceeded to initiate the Epicurean into those spiritual joys which the contemplation of God procures. He began, Hear the truth, Dorian, and receive the light. But he saw then that all heads were turned towards him, and everybody was making signs for him to be quiet. Dead silence prevailed in the theatre, broken at last by the strains of heroic music. The play began. The soldiers left their tents and were preparing to depart when a prodigy occurred. A cloud covered the summit of the funeral pile. Then the cloud rolled away, and the ghost of Achilles appeared, clad in golden armor. Extending his arms toward the warriors, he seemed to say to them, What? Do you depart, children of Danaos? Do you return to the land I shall never behold again, and leave my tomb without any offerings? Already the principal Greek chieftains pressed to the foot of the pile, Achimus, the son of Theseus, old Nestor, Agamemnon, bearing a scepter and with a fillet on his brow, gazed at the prodigy. Pyrrhus, the young son of Achilles, was prostrate in the dust. Ulysses, recognizable by the cap which covered his curly hair, showed by his gestures that he acquiesced in the demand of the hero's shade. He argued with Agamemnon, and their words might be easily guessed. Achilles, said the king of Ithaca, is worthy to be honored by us, for he died gloriously for Hellas. He demands that the daughter of Priam, the virgin Palazina, should be immolated on his tomb. Greeks, appease the manes of the hero, and let the son of Peleus rejoice in Hades. But the king of kings replied, Spare the Trojan virgins. We have torn from the altars. Sufficient misfortunes have already fallen on the illustrious race of Priam. He spoke thus because he shared the couch of the sister of Polyxena, and the wise Ulysses reproached him for preferring the couch of Cassandra to the lance of Achilles. The Greeks showed they shared the opinion of Ulysses by loudly clashing their weapons. The death of Polyxena was resolved on, and the appeased shade of Achilles vanished. The music, sometimes wild and sometimes plaintive, followed the thoughts of the personages in the drama. The spectators burst into applause. Paphnutius, who applied divine truth to everything, murmured, This fable shows how cruel the worshippers of false gods were. All religions breed crimes, replied the Epicurean. Happily, a Greek who is divinely wise has freed man from foolish terrors of the unknown. Just at that moment, Hecuba, her white hair disheveled, her robe tattered, came out of the tent in which she was kept captive. A long sigh went up from the audience when her woeful figure appeared. 
Hecuba, had been warned by a prophetic dream and lamented her daughter's fate and her own, Ulysses approached her and asked her to give up Polyxena. The old woman tore her hair, dug her nails into her cheeks, and kissed the hands of the cruel chieftain, who, with unpitying calmness, seemed to say, Be wise, Hecuba, and yield to necessity. There are amongst us many old mothers who weep for their children, now sleeping under the pines of Ida. And Hecuba, formerly queen of the most flourishing city in Asia, and now a slave, bowed her unhappy head in the dust. Then the curtain in front of one of the tents was raised, and the virgin Polyxena appeared. A tremor passed through all the spectators. They had recognized Thais. Paphnutius saw again the woman he had come to seek. With her white arm she held above her head the heavy curtain. Motionless as a splendid statue she stood, with a look of pride and resignation in her violet eyes, and her resplendent beauty made a shudder of commiseration pass through all who beheld her. A murmur of applause uprose, and Paphnutius, his soul agitated and pressing both hands to his heart, sighed, Why, O oh my God, hast thou given this power to one of thy creatures? Dorian was not so disturbed. He said, Certainly the atoms which have momentarily met together to form this woman present a combination which is agreeable to the eye. But that is but a freak of nature, and the atoms do not know what they do. They will some day separate with the same indifference as they came together. Where are now the atoms which formed Laius or Cleopatra? I must confess that women are sometimes beautiful but they are liable to grievous afflictions and disgusting inconveniences. That is patent to all thinking men, though the vulgar pay no attention to it, and women inspire love, though it is absurd and ridiculous to love them. Such were the thoughts of the philosopher and the ascetic as they gazed on Thais. They, neither of them, noticed Hecuba, who turned to her daughter and seemed to say by her gestures, Try to soften the cruel Ulysses. Employ your tears, your beauty, your youth. Thais, or rather Polyxena herself, let fall the curtain of the tent. She made a step forward, and all hearts were conquered. And when, with firm but light steps, she advanced toward Ulysses, her rhythmic movements, which were accompanied by the sound of flutes, created in all present such happy visions that it seemed as though she were the divine center of all the harmonies of the world. All eyes were bent on her, the other actors were obscured by her effulgence, and were not noticed. The play continued, however. The prudent son of Laertes turned away his head and hid his head under his mantle in order to avoid the looks and kisses of the suppliant. The virgin made a sign to him to fear nothing. Her tranquil gaze said, I follow you, Ulysses, and bow to necessity because I wish to die. Daughter of Priam and sister of Hector, my couch which was once worthy of kings shall never receive a foreign master. Freely do I quit the light of day. Hecuba, lying motionless in the dust, suddenly rose and enfolded her daughter in a last despairing embrace. Poxena, gently but resolutely, removed the old arms which held her. She seemed to say, Do not expose yourself, mother, to the fury of your master. Do not wait until he drags you ignominiously on the ground and tearing me from your arms. Better, O oh well-beloved mother, to give me your wrinkled hand, and to bend your hollow cheeks to my lips. The face of Thais looked beautiful in its grace. The crowd felt grateful to her for showing them the forms and passions of life endowed with superhuman grace, and Paphnutius pardoned her present splendor on account of her coming humility and glorified himself in advance for the saint he was about to give to heaven. 
The drama neared its end. Hecuba fell as though dead, and Polyxena, led by Ulysses, advanced toward the tomb, which was surrounded by the chief warriors. A dirge was sung as she mounted the funeral pile, on the summit of which the son of Achilles poured out libations from a gold cup to the manes of the hero. When the sacrificing priests stretched out their arms to seize her, she made a sign that she wished to die free and unbound, as befitted the daughter of so many kings. Then, tearing aside her robe, she bared her bosom to the blow. Pyrrhus, turning away his head, plunged his sword into her heart, and by a skilful trick the blood gushed forth over the dazzling white breast of the virgin, who, with head thrown back and her eyes swimming in the horrors of death, fell with grace and modesty. Whilst the warriors enshrouded the victim with a veil and covered her with lilies and anemones, terrified screams and groans rent the air, and Paphnutius, rising from his seat, prophesied in a loud voice, Gentiles, vile worshippers of demons, and you Arians more infamous than idolaters, learn that which you have just seen is an image and a symbol. There is a mystic meaning in this fable, and very soon the woman you see there will be offered a willing and happy sacrifice to the risen God. But already the crowd was surging in dark ways toward the exits. The abbot of Antinoe, escaping from the astonished Dorian, gained the door, still prophesying. An hour later, he knocked at the door of the house of Thais. The actress then lived in the rich Rakotis quarter, near the tomb of Alexander, in a house surrounded by shady gardens, in which a brook, bordered with poplars, flowed amidst artificial rocks. An old black slave woman, loaded with rings, opened the door, and asked what he wanted. "'I wish to see Thais,' he replied. "'God is my witness that I came here for no other purpose.' As he wore a rich tunic, and spoke in an imperious manner, the slave allowed him to enter. "'You will find Thais,' she said, "'in the Grotto of Nymphs.'" End of Part the First Section 2